Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Kakis, and I'm the health educator at the New Mexico Poison and Drug Information Center here at the University of New Mexico Health Science Center. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about summer poisons. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about what we're going to cover tonight, and that's going to, uh, again, review poisonings that are common to summertime, and we'll provide an overview of all the services that the NMPD IC, the New Mexico Poison and Drug Information Service Center services, uh, and then we'll open up with some discussion and questions if uh, anyone would like to. So summertime is a very busy time for us at the center. Um, as if you can see this PowerPoint, uh, May, June, and July typically of every year, you're looking at a graph for 2016. Those three months are typically um, much larger in call volume than any other month of the year. Uh, usually by two to 300 calls compared to other months out of the year. And that's just because of the nature of the season. So kids are home for school. They have a whole lot of time on their hands. Um, folks are out camping. They're coming up, uh, up against uh, poisons in the outdoors a lot more than they would have been uh, during any other month. So that's the reasoning for that. Um, so we're going to start off with snakes. Uh, we have seven different species of rattlesnakes in New Mexico. The snake season runs from April through October for rattlesnakes. And we also have coral snakes here in New Mexico, but they're usually just um, exclusively in the southwest, southwest region of New Mexico, and they're usually too small to bite through human skin, usually. However, their venom is extremely potent and lethal, as well as the rattlesnake's venom is extremely potent and um, can be very well be lethal. So the bottom left picture is a rattlesnake. You can see the diamond shape of his head. Um, the middle picture is a coral snake. So the saying goes, uh, red on yellow will kill a fellow. And then we have a milk snake that really uh, largely resembles a um, coral snake, but they're not poisonous. And the saying goes for that one is, um, red on black, venom lack. So that's how you remember that one. Okay. So again, uh, rattlesnake uh, venom is very, very, very potent and can very likely be lethal if you don't get yourself to where the anti-venom is, and that's at the hospitals. It's not sold over the counter. You can't pick it up at a pharmacy, so you have to get to uh, a hospital to get that taken care of if you get bit by a rattlesnake. The good news is, is that there's a lot of common uh, sense steps that you can take to prevent yourself from getting bit by a rattlesnake or any other poisonous snake. Uh, and they're really, they're more scared of us than we are of them. So uh, do not try to capture or handle a poisonous snake, obviously, because that's going to threaten them and they will try to protect themselves by biting you. Uh, you're going to want to walk in cleared areas where it's easy to see where you step or uh, reach your hands. Um, or your feet, put, putting your feet down. Use a walking stick to wrestle shrubs or brush to alert snakes of your presence. Uh, try to wear long pants and boots. I know it's steaming hot right now uh, when you're taking hikes, but it is the best protection that you can have um, as clothing-wise uh, against a rattlesnake bite. Um, and also rattlesnakes can sense the heat coming off of your bare skin, so that's further protection. And uh, when you're hiking, I know a lot of people like, they like to get outdoors by themselves because that's their time for meditation and to, you know, that's, that's their me time. But if you, um, it's really the best idea is to take someone else hiking with you so that they can go get help if you do get bit. Because as we're going to talk more in a minute, you're not going to want to be walking around or um, anything else that gets your gets your blood flowing faster than normal because you don't want that venom to get to your heart uh, faster than normal. Um, if you don't want to take someone else with you, you better make sure that you have a cellular phone on you and that you have service where you're going to go. Um, and then also wear gloves and moving rocks or brush because that's where they uh, seek shade in the intense summer heat underneath the rocks or in brush. Uh, so some more tips prevention wise. Never put your hands or feet into places where you cannot see. Patch holes in your home that are more than one inch, one quarter of an inch wide, and be careful when working in a crawl space. Always, always, always carry your cell phone, and please program it with the Poison Help Hotline. And that's 
222-1222. Now also, if you visit our website at nmpoisoncenter.unm.edu, you will see, if you scroll down to We Help With Medications too, in that specific uh, section on our homepage, there's going to be a little icon that says um, download our virtual card. And if you uh, do that with your cell phone and you press that little icon, then it will download all of our contact information. It's really cool. You'll get our Facebook page. You'll have the um, hotline number automatically downloaded to your cell phone. You'll have our um, website. You'll have every um, contact point of contact information there is for the Poison Center downloaded automatically to your cell phone. So I highly suggest that you do that. Okay, so if you do get bit by a rattlesnake or any other poisonous snake, please try to remain calm. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you really need to try to remain calm again so you don't get that blood flowing any faster than it normally does because we don't want that venom getting to the heart and out to other organs any faster. Um, put a safe distance between you and the snake. You need to get to the hospital again immediately because anti-venom or anti-venom is the only accepted treatment. That is the only definitive treatment. We do not recommend um, slashing uh, X marks on the bite and sucking out the venom or tourniquets or any kind of field treatment at all. Um, keep the bite area immobilized and level with your heart. Again, because of uh, we don't want to get into your, the blood getting to your heart any faster than normal. Uh, so again, do not put ice on the bite or try to suck the venom out with your mouth. And if you do get bit, you need to get to the hospital right away, call 911, and then in the meantime, while you're waiting for emergency services, you can call us at the New Mexico Poison Center for first aid advice, further first aid advice. And again, that number is 1-800-222-1222. So this is really, really super cool. This is a must for any outdoor adventurist, I think. It's called Snake Bite 911, and it's an app that's put out by Profat who makes the anti-venom for rattlesnake bites. Um, so let's see. So if we click on this icon here, it'll take you to their site where you can download their um, app. So they have um, an app for the public, Snake Bite 911 for the general public, and they also have one for first responders. Super cool. All, look at all the information they have on here. They have emergency support for snake bites. They have a quick dial 911. They have a checklist of actions to avoid, timestamp the venom tracker tool, hospital locator, North American pit vipers, species information, how to stay uh, snake safe, and snake sightings map, which is really cool. So to show and add snake sightings that occurred in your local area, wherever you're hiking or whatever. So again, um, it's a free app. Go and download it right off um, the Play Store. Go, go to the Play Store, and it's available for um, um, what do I try to say? iPhones and Androids. There we go. <laughs> okay, let's see. How do I get back here? Let's see. Your PowerPoint is at the bottom, towards the left. Where are we at here? Click there. And then it's the top, top one. one. Okay. I just got, um, let's see, now where am I going? So just okay. play it again, start it again. Let's see, I'll just yeah. find the slide. Okay, there we go. So I just got these progressive glasses where they got the prescription totally wrong because my stigmatism is so bad, so I'm, that's why I'm like, okay. <laughs> We were just talking about the need for all of us here getting these prescription glasses. Okay. No worries. This is good. Oh, no, we need to put it in slide show. Yeah. Right here? That's down at the bottom, and right, right there. Right, one, right. One, 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 there one, 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 one. Okay. All right, sorry about that, folks. Um, so I would like to go over uh, a real case that we had at the NMPDC, I see, um, a couple years back. And this case really underscores um, just how extensive our services are and just how talented of a group our specialists are. They're really, 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 I mean, very highly trained in toxicology. People, when you need help with a poisoning, they, these are the people you want to call. And doctors call us too, just so everyone knows. So 
A doctor, a doctor calls the poison, poison center after a three-year-old boy is transported to an emergency room in the northwest region of rural New Mexico. The doctor is frantic and reports to the poison specialist that the toddler is completely unresponsive, bleeding out of the eyes, nose, and mouth, and is presenting with disseminating intravascular coagulation. The doctor also reported that the boy had been playing in a field with his cousins when they found him lying under a bush unresponsive. The specialist told the doctor to load the child immediately with rattlesnake antivenom. The doctor said, but there aren't any visible snake bites. The specialist again said, no, you need to load this child with antivenom immediately um, because it's the snake bite is the most definitive um, symptoms of the, what you're describing. So after loading the <clears throat> boy with antivenom, the specialist then recommended that the doctor can then inspect between toes, under arms, et cetera, for evidence of the bite. The doctor followed the specialist's recommendations and found that there was indeed a bite between the toddler's toes. The toddler was eventually transferred to UNMH where, thankfully, he made a full recovery. If the doctor didn't promptly follow the specialist's recommendations, the boy would have certainly died. So that's, you know, that's, this is what they deal with um, on a daily basis almost in, in New Mexico during the summer, these kinds of poisonings. So more creepy crawlers, spiders. So in New Mexico, we have the black widow which is shiny, usually black, not always black, though. Um, they have even been found as white, believe it or not. But shiny, black, round abdomen, usually one to two inches in di diameter. Um, the female is the one with the ventral marking and is the one, with the, is the one who is venomous. Um, and that marking is usually an hourglass shape, but it doesn't have to be. It can be red, it can be orange, uh, different shapes. But we don't recommend you flipping it over to look at its belly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it really like these guys really like wood piles, and that's where they typically uh, live. Not not exclusively, but you can surely find them in large wood piles. Uh, their venom is very potent, and it causes very severe muscle spasms. I've heard it likened to uh, major Charlie horse all over your body, which can last um, up to two weeks. So very 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 painful, especially in children. We also have the brown spider, and it's a very close relative to the brown recluse. Um, there's three species, the blonde of the desert and the Apache. It's usually light to dark brown, and body plus the legs, the entire length is usually an inch. Uh, these guys live under rocks and wood piles also, and in burrows. Their venom, again, is very potent and can be lethal, um, especially in small children. So if you've ever seen a... Um, brown recluse bite they look the same they start as kind of like a little target and then it begins to eat away the skin even down to you know through the bone very nasty nasty uh sores they leave and definitely need medical attention okay so spider bite prevention in the first aid you're going to want to dust and vacuum around your windows corners of rooms and under furniture regularly to remove the webs wear gloves when working with wood piles brush rocks um, and avoid stacking wood against your home. Teach children not to play around wood piles, road ties, and et cetera. And just for a second, let me revert back to snakes. Please teach children not to play with snakes and don't let your children play around in uh, very tall brush um, or anything like that to avoid snake bites. Um, again, picking up where we left off with spider bite prevention, shake your shoes before wearing, have a professional exterminate for poisonous spiders on a regular basis. Um, and definitely request a uh, pesticide um, that is safe for uh, children and pets. And if you think you've been bitten by a spider that can cause serious illness, again, please don't wait for uh, symptoms to appear. Call the New Mexico Poison Center right away, again, at 1-800-222-1222. Other venomous critters in New Mexico, we also have scorpions here. Um, all over the state. However, uh, the only one that really causes serious medical illness and death in children, especially in children and the elderly, is the Arizona bark, and that's found in southwest New Mexico. Um, they're usually uh, light uh, brown or tan, and they're one inch in length. Uh, the symptoms that come on are pain and burning at the side of the bite, numbness and tingling, distance to the side of the bite, difficulty swallowing, um, and an increase in saliva or drooling, muscle twitching, respiratory problems, slurred speech, restlessness, and irritability. And the eyes also twitch back and forth like really fast. That's another common symptom of being bit by an Arizona bark. 
Uh, they like dark and damp places, and they can climb all surfaces except glass. So what we want to do to uh, prevent a scorpion bite with children is to put crib legs in glass jars and shield the top of the netting and shield the top of the uh, crib with netting or the, whatever their sleeping area is. Wear shoes when outdoors, especially around swimming pools and uh, lakes at night. Shake all shoes and towels, especially damp swimming towels and bedding before using. And then again, professionally exterminate on a regular basis with a safe pesticide. If you if you uh, suspect that you are you have been stung, uh, call the New Mexico Poison Center again right away for treatment advice. One eight hundred two 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 one two two two. Insect sting prevention. We want to keep those uh, trash cans covered. Put leftover food away. Avoid wearing brightly colored clothing and uh, heavily uh, scented perfumes. Move away from the insect without waving your hands and arms crazily. Uh, and then if you have severe uh, allergic symptoms and that cause, uh, you know, medical emergencies, uh, make sure you wear a medic alert bracelet and um, ask your physician for an EpiPen so you can have that on hand when you're outdoors in the summertime. Okay, so moving on to poisonous plants. In New Mexico, we have several uh, species of plants in New Mexico that are native and can cause serious medical il illness. Uh, to name three here in the picture, we have the foxglove on the left, uh, oleander top right, and jimson weed on the bottom right, all of which again can cause serious medical illness and sometimes death. So in order to, point, to prevent um, getting poisoned by plants, you need to first know your plants indoor and outdoor. Um, you can ask your local garden center to identify the plants around your home and then label your plants with their common and botanical names. Because if you, So if you have to call the uh, poison center, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And then once you've done this on a preventive measure, you can call the poison center also to find out if a plant is poisonous. Okay? Uh, keep all plants, bulbs, and seeds, plant foods uh, where children and pets cannot reach them. Teach children not to eat any part of a plant whatsoever, including leaves, stems, barks, berries, seeds, nuts, um, and anything else that is part of a plant. Remove mushrooms from your yard and teach children never to touch, taste, or eat an outdoor mushroom. Uh, teach, let's see, do not uh, think that a plant or berry is safe or any kind of other part of the plant is safe just because an animal or bird eats it and is okay. Do not rely on cooking to destroy poisons and plants, and be careful when using plants as medicines or herbal drinks. So plant first aid, if um, a child has eaten any part of a plant, uh, get the plant out of their mouth as, um, as much as you can, what's ever left in their mouth, and rinse thoroughly with water. Then uh, if, a, if the skin is exposed to a toxic plant, wash with water and soap thoroughly and then remove all clothing that has to come in, that has come in contact with the plant and then call us again right away for treatment advice do not please wait for symptoms to appear um, because sometimes when they appear it's too late frankly so the number again is 1-800-222-1222 now if a person and this is true in any uh, poisoning instance whether it be plants um, stings whatever bites uh, ingestions, if the person that has been poisoned has become unconscious or collapses, has any kind of trouble breathing at all, or is having seizures, shaking all over, um, you need to call 911 in that instance right away. Forget calling us, okay? All right, so food poisoning. We all have had food poisoning, I'm sure. So the symptoms of the onset is at about four hours after you eat the poisoned food. And it usually uh, passes within 24 hours, but it's usually a very miserable 24 hours. Uh, keep, so to avoid uh, food poisoning, you're going to want to keep cold foods cold and hot foods hot before and after serving. Cook all foods to recommended temperatures. And when camping or picnicking or outdoors, whatever, uh, pack soap and water or hand sanitizer and wash your hands carefully before and after handling food. And then put the leftover food in the ice chest right away. So carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, uh, and invisible gas. Uh, the symptoms usually resemble the flu, but without fever. So we don't want you ever to use uh, gas-fired barbecue and charcoal grills inside tents, RVs, etc., like 
in, in order to try to warm them up, even if the doors are open. Use only battery powered uh, heaters and lights and tents and trailers, motorhomes, etc. Never use full fuel burning appliances inside, including generators. Install uh, carbon monoxide detectors in RVs and uh, motorhomes, trailers, etc. Again, be sure to replace those batteries every season. And then, of course, if you think someone has been poisoned by carbon monoxide gas, call us right, again, right away again at 1 800 222 1222. All right, so other items that need to be kept out of sight and reach of children and preferably locked up include medications, particularly the ones that we're having the most trouble with are painkillers um, and Suboxone patches. Suboxone is um, a treatment for opioid addiction. But if the child gets a hold of one of these patches, it could very well be lethal to that child very easily. All alcohol products. Um, including hand sanitizers. Hand sanitizers have up to usually range from, uh, I want to say 65 to 80 percent alcohol, so they're loaded with alcohol. Um, it's not something you want your child getting into. A child weighing 25 pounds or less, um, having consumed hard liquor, for example, like, let's say three ounces of hard liquor, that could be lethal to that child. So we do want to keep, make sure your guests know to keep their drinks out of uh, sight and reach of children at gatherings. All right, so household cleaners and those um, detergent pods, whether they be for the dishwasher or the uh, clothes washer, those are extremely toxic, even if they just bite into them just for a second. Um, they cause severe medical uh, illness, and you need to keep those pods out of sight and reach, definitely locked up if you can. Batteries, especially the button batteries, are very attractive to children, and they cause um, major problems, particularly if the child swallows more than one and those batteries connect in the intestines. It tears their intestines apart and can um, uh, twist them very badly and cause severe problems. And if they get stuck in the uh, respiratory tract or somewhere along the uh, esophagus, something like that, um, we've seen them burn all the way through out to the outside. So a big hole to the outside. So they'll burn all the way through the tissue. So um, uh, hearing aids, uh, most uh, tech applied, like um, remote controls, uh, they all have these button batteries. So please be aware of that and keep those out of sight and reach from children. If you're particularly concerned, put tape over the battery compartments if they don't have those screws that, uh, that lock them in. Okay, so all nicotine products also need to be kept out of sight and reach of children. That includes e-cig e juice um, and paraphernalia and nicotine patches. Nicotine is super, super toxic. A lot of people don't realize just how much it is. It's right below arsenic in its um, amount per kilogram of a person that it takes to kill uh, one. So very toxic. Pool and hot tub products. Uh, these are usually caustic and cause severe burns. So they definitely need to be kept out of sight and reach. And adults, please handle with care. Pesticides and insecticides, again, adults handle with care. Gasoline, um, keep out of sight and reach. Adults handle with care. All hydrocarbons need to be out of sight and reach. Those are tiki torch oils and other uh, types of oils which are very toxic if ingested. Um, and please keep all of these items that we just discussed in their original containers and store it away from food and drink because it is just too hard to fall into the look-alike trap, even for adults. We get, you wouldn't believe the Poison Center gets the calls on this all the time. And if I know a teenage, my teenage daughter, she'll be like this looking at her cell phone going, what, FaceTime, what? Grabs the wind, you know, she would grab what she's not paying attention to whatever she's doing. So this is very common, um, especially if they're stored together food and, and uh, cleaners. So we want to store them apart and keep them in their original containers so you have better protection at knowing what it is. I know it's tempting when folks go camping and stuff. They say, oh, I just need a little bit of this. I'm just going to pour it in a water bottle, an old water bottle. Don't do that. Just and don't do that. The original container should have some type of child food. It should. It should. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it should by the uh, poison prevention packaging law. Um, so that's why... Another reason why we say please keep them in their original containers. And if you need to call the poison center, we need to, I mean, there's so many different kinds of, let, let's say, Clorox. There's the gel. There's, you know, different concentrations. It's really helpful for us to know exactly what 
it is we're dealing with. Okay, so fireworks. The glow sticks have dibutyl phthalate in them, which is a serious irritant to the eyes, nose, and mouth, but the um, symptoms usually pass quite quickly. Uh, potassium nitrate, white phosphorus, barium chlorate, and arsenic are also uh, common compounds, chemical compounds in the um, fireworks, and ingesting these in large amounts can cause kidney failure and even death. So you might say, well, why would a child, you know, after eating one, want to eat another? Sometimes, you know, they're made to smell good, just like other products, and they look like other food and drink a lot of times, especially the glow sticks. So just be aware of that and supervise children closely when we were doing fireworks this year on the 4th. So on to Poison Center Services. This year we're celebrating 40 years with the UNM College of Pharmacy. Uh, that is the program that administers our program, the Poison Center. Um, so we're glad and proud to say that we've been with them for 40 years now. We used to be in, um, called uh, BCMC, where I was born, which is now UNMH. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's where we were housed in the 70s, but um, now we have been with the College of Pharmacy for 40 years. So the services that we offer, I have to brag, I'm so proud to work where I work because this program is just so cool and offers so many cool things. Um, so first of all, there's the two telephone-based services, the Poison Helpline and the Drug Information Line, both at the same number, 1-800-222-1222. So Poison Helpline, you can call for any type of question that you may have about a poison or if you need help with a poison emergency. Um, the Drug Information Line is a program where you can call for any type of question that you have about your medications, whether it be, can I take this with that? Um, I found a, a tablet and I don't know what it is. I dropped, I dropped my uh, pill organizer and I can't figure out which one goes where. And I, I don't know what this tablet is. Um, they'll identify that for you. Um, and it's offered in over 70 different languages, including Navajo. So the people that man these two telephone services are all certified specialists in poison information. They're all registered pharmacists with extensive training in toxicology. So these guys go through years of training before they're even allowed to become certified with a test. And the test they have to take every five years for certification. And it's a very, very rigorous, difficult test to pass. And we have gotten the highest scores out of the nation for the past five years. So again, a very talented group of people. And if you need help with the poisoning, these are the people you want to call and talk to. Um, all these service, all of our services are free. The telephone service is a fast, free, confidential expert um, device that you, is at the tip of your fingers. Please use it. It's a free public service program. That's what we're here for. Um, and we want the public to really understand, call before you go. So again, if this poison person is not unconscious or having trouble breathing or seizuring, please call us right away um, before you decide to try to drive miles to go into the hospital or call the EMS um, when they could be serving a heart attack victim or something like that. Because again, that's what we're here for and that's what we're trained for to do. Um, so we really want the public to, to understand that. So please, please pass that along to your patients and whoever you serve. Um, and also, the call center serves, a, serves the public during emergencies. So when we had that big outbreak with the swine flu, we um, contracted with the Department of Health and field the calls from the public regarding where, uh, if the latest vaccines were available, where they were at, and just general um, uh, first aid or medical advice for the illness. So it's really super cool. Um, the PC service has continued. We do offer both public and professional education. Uh, the, we have two medical, doc, medical toxicologists on site um, who do bedside consults for people who have to be hospitalized. So if, if you call us and that patient has been, for the poison patient, if it's too severe to handle over the phone, we will uh, facilita facilitate their um, going to the hospital and getting set up in the hospital, and then they'll also go back out and do bedside consults or, you know, via telephone um, to move them through the hospital faster and give them the best treatment they, they can get. And by the way, we um, average about 82% of our calls uh, safely on site or at home, so they don't have to go into the hospital, so that saves the state a huge amount of money. 
We also coordinate customized patient care and residential cleanup. So uh, again, a couple years ago, this family, they had they've been using an old school uh, thermometer when one of their kids were sick with the mercury in it. And one of the kids got a hold of it and broke it. And it was when they're on the couch and it seeped all in the cushions, it went everywhere. And you know, mom was vacuuming in the meantime, just spreading it everywhere, vaporizing it everywhere. And their, their uh, levels were so high. So when they called us, their levels were so alarmingly high, we called the EPA, organized to get them out there to test their house for levels, which were so off the chart that the EPA people had to fully garb in which you would seem like a science fiction movie, go out there and it took them weeks on weeks to, to clean it. And finally, the family did get to move back in, but it took a lot of time and effort to, to get that, but we do coordinate things like that. And we have a real time, so the phone system, uh, the data when folks call in on an aggregate level, of course, is only available to the DOH or other organizations that we partner with. Um, so they can use the system for biological outbreaks like the CDC does to detect them before they become an epidemic or an endemic. Um, because the system is in real time, near real time. So when people call in for advice, we load it into the data system, into the National Poison Data System, and it's updated every eight to 12 minutes. So in near real time, and it's very helpful for, like I said, CDC, EPA, um, all kinds of government organizations to be able to uh, sequester data from that for their own purposes. So um, that's about all I have for my talk this evening. Um, Right now, I suppose I can field questions or comments, and my uh, all my contact information again is is up there on the screen. Now, anybody who wants to order materials can go directly to our website, which is right there on the screen, NM Poison Center. Unm. That is wrong. NM Poison Center. Unm. Edu. Sorry about that. Not dot com. NM Poison Center. Unm. Edu. Um. And order materials right there. We have activity books for children. We've got magnets, all for free. So if you want materials to hand out to your patients or whomever for your home, please get on there and order them. We'll get them right out to you. Do we want to try and look at your web page? Do you sure. Let's see. Let's see. How can we get out of here? Let's see. Escape. Let's escape. And then we'll go to our web page. All right. So yeah. there's there's the crow fab. Um, App, I was saying you can also get off our website. Why and here, because we didn't see it the last time. You didn't see Chrome Yeah. No. Oh, you didn't see it. Because we, we never got to see the last time. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, here's that uh, Snakebite 911 application. Like I said, you can get it from Google Store or Play Store for both iPhone and Androids. They've got it for the general public. Many, many cool features, including a snake sightings map. And there's also one for first responders. So again, if you are an outdoors person, take the time to download this app. It's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Okay, here also is our virtual reality card. So let's just go ahead and see what it gets us on here. So I'm playing along with you. I've got my uh, iPhone open, so I can download this. Oh, uh, yeah. It wants it wants either an email account or uh, you know your iPhone. It's not going to just let me. Yeah, yeah. And just so that you know, I did do that, and it came up in about two seconds. Good. Good deal. I am. It is in my contact so list. Yay! No. Oh. Okay, so uh, ordering materials. So right here on the main navigation bar, order materials online. Just click and provide all your information, please, and provide event information if it's for an event, but if not, then don't bother. And then here's all the materials. So we've got you know our magnets, Spanish and English, telephone labels. We've got uh, QR cards where you can download all our information again, but again, the V card is probably the best option. Because uh, these are a little dated. Uh, so, oh, we also have medical uh, trackers, wallet cards. These are really cool. They fold up accordion style and really handle. We have all your medication um, 
information or your personal information and all the medicines that you take that you can have on hand whenever you go to the doctor or pharmacist or just when you know some emergency arises where they need to know what you're on. That's awesome. Yeah, so those are really cool. Um, then our children's activity books. We've got a number of uh, brochures for literature for poison prevention. So yeah, just submit your order. And so it looks like there's some small fees, but... No, you know, we... A long time ago, they, and I probably should just take that off. This is, those are for orders like when they're ordering, you know, thousands of, but because it says for the first 100 are free of each one. But if I get a nonprofit organization calling me for, you know, really good cause and stuff and wanting like hundreds, I'm going to just give it to them. I'm not going to charge Yeah, because that's, I mean, all of this is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, so also, if you'd like, like to view our materials, materials, you can go to, let's see, is it public education? Mm -hmm. Do we see a download materials? Mm -hmm. Oh, the next one. There we go. Mm -hmm. So um, you can view, like, for example, brochures, Could You Be Next? So you can view, you can view the materials under download, and then, of course, download them if you'd like. Okay, but if you want to order in bulk, then go to our order online. Thank you, Jack. You're so welcome. And Dr. Sagan, I saw you diligently taking notes. I do have yeah, some questions. Are there, any, are there any questions from the audience first? Let's, Let's go up to. Let's see. Okay. Let me look here. Their questions will be more important than mine. I don't see any open questions at this time, but we are taking questions. Okay. And I don't have anything on my phone at this time. Okay. So, Jackie, I just had a little bit more. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about just poison centers in general, because every uh, every so often it's in the news about that the poison center funding is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And I, um, and being part of EMS for Children, we get notification of that as well. So maybe you could say a little bit about where the funding comes from and what it's dependent on because I think people tend not to call like you mentioned in your talk and it's really better for them to call. It gives them information but it also helps your numbers which help is linked to your funding. Right, right. right. And, and it's, it's, it's good for the public to know especially from um, a doctor's perspective that at the centers we have um, we have access to very expensive resources like texts and um, databases and stuff like that that doctors don't. And that's why they're, they're housed in a specific place like at the Poison Center. And that's when you guys refer to us because you don't have those things to refer to. So that's when doctors and healthcare professionals call us all the time as well. Um, but particularly to the funding, uh, the basic model is we get a little bit of funding from HRSA nationally, or federally rather. Um, but primarily, at least at the New Mexico Poison Center, primarily our funding comes from the state. We used to be in general funds, but, or I mean not general funds, but um, special projects, I think it was called. Yeah, and then we finally got moved to general funds, which was good. But um, our funds, as with any other, you know, entity or school or anything that relies on state funds, is as um, contingent to what you know they're going to appropriate. So, uh, for some reason, the poison center gets picked on, even though it is a needed program. Uh, for example, there were three of New York's poison centers closed down at one point. And they found that emergency room visits, and it was such a major cost to the state that they reinstated one, I believe. Louisiana tried the same thing. They closed down their one and only poison center, like our one, and we only have one. Um, and the, the impact on their medical health care system was so severe that they were forced to reinstate it. Because like I said, with um, successfully treating over 80% of poison cases at home or on site, that saved the state last fiscal year, I want to say 20 some million, mm. or no, 18 million rather. Mm -hmm. And then um, by the medical toxicologist moving the uh, patients faster through the hospital uh, in an extra nearly 30 some 
million was saved. So we near we saved near like forty nine million in healthcare costs last fiscal year. Wow. So that's where our funding comes from. And again, it's contingent on what the state will appropriate towards us. Um, so we're kind of we're always kind of hanging in the in the balance. And it's for the audience. It's, you know, if you haven't used the Poison Center and use them as a resource, they're an incredible resource. It is. Even if in the ER, even if I am very well aware of the poison and what to do in the management, I still call the Poison Center about the patient, just because um, one, I double check myself, and two, they even do follow up on the patients mm -hmm. and yes. will call with follow up and make sure that your patients um, continue to be safe and recover. So it's a great resource. So. And please call early, call often. Thank you, Dr. Sapien. And they'll do that for the poison patient at home as well. They'll call back as long as they think they need to, depending on you know the, the particular situation. Sometimes they'll call uh, three days out just to make sure. And that is a really cool feature. And these people, they really know their stuff. And I know the public sometimes struggles with whether or not to call the poison center because they think we might be affiliated with uh, CYFD or, or uh, law enforcement, and we're not. I mean, of course, if they truly suspected that the child was being um, abused, then yes, they would be obligated to, but we don't automatically say, oh, guess what, you know, so-and-so, uh, their kid did this on their watch, and hey, you might want to pay them a visit, but that's not the case. So please call us. It's completely confidential. Uh, some parents think that uh, it's um, not a responsible thing to do. They'd rather take their kid to be physically seen by a doctor. And just to know, just to trust us, I mean, these people, they really know their stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, the other thing just about in general, and poison centers in general, uh, that is a universal number, correct? So that is, if, our, if our providers are, uh, or any of us happen to be traveling out of state, we could call the same number, we'd be connected to the local poison center, not the New Mexico poison center. Correct. It's, that's a universal number. it's a national number, it's right. not oh. universal for the, glo not globally, but yes, nationally, yeah. it will route you to the nearest poison center. Your so if you call anywhere in New Mexico, you'll get us. Okay. And then is there, does your website or do you have, the, your specialists have the capability of receiving photographs at all? Because I was wondering about like for plan identification, things like that. Um, they, yes, they could very well, you know, with their own HSC uh, oh, um, email, if they wanted to give that out while they're trying to uh, manage this case, they can do that. And also for snakes, too. I mean, you want to put yourself in safe distance from a snake, but if you can get it on camera, a picture of it, that's also good, too, and okay. as well as plants, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. great. So well, I'm terrified now. I was I, I <laughs> set up an appointment for my house to be have pesticides. <laughs> Just now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, I was going to put my sneaker on the other day, and there was a spider in my shoe that was in the garage, and I, I actually had a premonition right before, like, I should look in there. And yes. there he was. And there he was. Around. I'm itching. <laughs> <laughs> So not so much not so much questions as just some other kind of added information. So you talked about alcohol, um, and certainly we, especially in the summer with parties and stuff oh, and supervision oh. of you know for kids, you know drinking adults adult beverages that are left out, etc. And just for the providers, um, from a pediatric standpoint, I just want to um, remind you and give you some information that certainly when kids are poisoned with alcohol, they may present um, with altered mental status. Uh, and intoxicated, but um, they're probably more likely to present with seizures, actually. And the seizure mechanism of seizures for children that are poisoned with alcohol is actually not from the alcohol directly, but in children, what the alcohol does once it's introduced into the, into the pediatric body is it causes them to lower their glucose, and so their seizures are actually from hypoglycemia or hypoglycemic seizure. So uh, if you are doing a run for those, uh, for those children, um, you know, make sure that you check a glucose and administer um, glucose if you need to, um, because that's the mechanism for that. Um, the other thing for nicotine, um, so all of those things that Jackie mentioned are really put a child at risk, and it doesn't take much for a child to um, to have a nicotine poisoning. Also, they present with seizures with that, um, but um, it doesn't take much in that even if they're chewing on cigarette butts that have been smoked, um, they can be exposed to nicotine for that. And then the um, other thing that I wanted to talk about just a little bit were the, um, the hydrocarbons 
and ask and um, and the risk from that. So as Jackie mentioned, they are extremely poisonous. Their mechanism is um, so they're a bit heavy of a liquid, but um, they're heavy and vaporized at the same time. So um, they, it, 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 when they swallow, when the child swallows the hydrocarbon, um, they may get a little bit of aspiration from that, but then they get a secondary aspiration from the evaporation, vaporization of the hydrocarbon in the stomach, and so then they end up with an aspiration, and it's really a respiratory problem that they that you're probably going to be seeing. They can cause altered mental status as well, but you're probably going to see them as a respiratory problem when they're doing hydrocarbon. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was um, just uh, an unabashed, abashed, um, advertisement for our safety app also that is linked to Jackie's website. And we uh, developed, uh, Joan Caldwell, who's in, the, in our studio audience right now, developed that and it's uh, a home safety app for and that's also downloadable for you can use it to instruct families or give the link to families and it really walks a family through the um, floor plan of a home and goes through various places that the child could get injured and then talks including poisonings and then talks about prevention uh, modalities or prevention approaches for those individual areas and the Words, downloadable words are Child Ready Home Safety App. Home, home safety, safety Tool. Home Safety Tool. So Child Ready Home Safety okay. Tool, and it is available for Android as well as iProducts uh, I and will be available in Spanish within the next uh, three to four months as well. Can I have one last thing? Yeah. Just, just so folks out there um, understand, or I don't want to leave this point not underscored, because kids are home with a lot of time on their hands in the summer, it really is imperative, please, to, to keep that alcohol locked away or somewhere where they cannot get into it, and the medications, particularly the opioids. Again, I just wanted to stress that one more time. Okay. Well, Jackie, I can't thank you enough for coming in this evening, uh, sure. taking time out of your busy day to join us, and for the rest of you who came in uh, in the evenings to help facilitate this awesome conversation. Uh, give us about a week to 10 days to put this on our archive page, and then you will be able to access it from there. Thank you again for joining us from home or work. We do appreciate everything you do each day. And uh, next time will be on September the 19th. Thank you so much. Before Kevin, can oh, you yes, just sir. remind them how to get their seat, continuing education and the time frame for that? What will happen is that within 24 hours, you will be getting a follow-up email, um, and it will thank you for attending. All those in attendance, the absentee will not get it. Um, and then in the email itself, we'll have a link so that you can go ahead and use that link, and it will take you right to a place where you will register for your CEs. And you will, survey. As you, yes, as you um, register for your CE, um, an automatic certificate will be uh, populated after you submit it. Please print that for your records. And thank you, Joan, for setting that up for us, because I know that that's a huge service to our EMS providers to have this free and printable at home. And remember, it's live um, CE, which means it's considered like a classroom, so it's not an online course. Um, and that sometimes is um, in, uh, important because you are allowed a certain number of hours in the classroom and then online. And so this is considered a classroom or a live CE. But only if you attend live. The, the yes. archive one is not considered live. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you, Jackie. That sure. was outstanding.